Good. So I want us to transition to the violin part of the violin podcast. Now that we've discussed your career a little bit, I would love to talk about the violin that you're playing on and your approach to the violin technique, all that stuff. Sure. So I've gone through so many changes with different violins in the past year, actually. But currently I'm playing a Brothers Amati violin that actually Serena Huang played recently. That's right. Yeah. We were talking about that before we started rolling and you have the violin in the studio. Yes. The one that she won the Indianapolis competition with. Yes, yes, yes. How did you, how did you manage to get that? <laughs> Serena, <laughs> hi, hello, if you're listening. <laughs> Total luck, actually. Um, you know, we're, as young artists, we're always searching for an instrument to play. They cost a ridiculous amount of money. So uh, we keep searching for someone who it will cost me a kidney and maybe a liver, two livers, and two. I don't have and I don't have more than one. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I called up a friend uh, in Chicago, who who owns Darton and Hirsch Violins, Fine Violins. I'm butchering the name of the shop, but <laughs> but I called him up and I asked, is there is there anything possibly that I can play on uh, for the near future? And he said. Actually, Serena is about to come on a Friday to drop off the violin that she was just playing on, the Samati. Would you like to try it? I said, yes. I immediately flew to Chicago, tried it for like three hours and... Fell in love. Fell in love and, and took it. And then I had a concerto performance like two days after I took the violin. So it was like immediately <laughs> to, had to do the job. <laughs> what, what was the adjustment period? Did you did you feel like an instant connection or did you feel like there are some certain qualities of the violin that... You kind of had to get used to right away. Yeah, you had to. I had to get used to it um, a little bit because it's a very sensitive instrument in that it has such a personality on its own, um, and I can't just you know do what I want and expect it to respond just because I want I want it. So I had to figure out its particular colors um, and how the sound rings. Uh, because that's very different on each instrument. It's so fascinating. I would love to hear you play. Of course, we're in a, in a, in a dry studio, but we this is the first time where I'm t talking to someone who, you know, same violin, two people. Yeah, yeah. That's wild. <laughs> yes. You know, that's definitely for the records. Um, are you? Do you care about bows? Do you do you have a like a um, like a specific bow that you've had for a long time, or did you switch the bow with uh, the instrument? Yeah, uh, I'm. I wish I knew more about bows. I wish I, you know, had a bigger knowledge on, you know, what kind of wood or, you know, what, what that does. Unfortunately, I um, feel more comfortable with the difference in violence. But I do have a bow from Benoit Roland mm. that I just got last year, and I really love it. And it has a Galian frog. Have you heard of those? No, I haven't. It's his invention. It's a, a tilted frog. So the purpose of it is so that so that the hair on the on the bow <clears throat> keeps uh, flat for a greater amount of time. Oh. So as it gets to the tip of the bow, as you as you draw the bow, it kind of stays flat more or less, unless you like really tilt it. That's interesting. Yeah. Are you a <clears throat> player that plays close to the bridge a lot or close to the fingerboard? <laughs> Close to the fingerboard. My teachers will kill me. But <laughs> no, I I'm, just yeah. I, okay. What for about all you? my for all my violin teach uh, all my violin students, play near the bridge. Please. I know, I know. <laughs> play near the bridge. It's gonna help you. Yes. You get a nice core sound. Unless you're playing on a brother's Amati, then you can do whatever you want. Okay. 